you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Tips and tricks at two on Tuesdays for Be So Creative in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm Sandy, and I particularly enjoy garment making. And so Marcia and the ladies asked if I would do some work with that on you. Those of you who were with us last week know that I did a little bit um, with you then. But today we're going to be focusing on these palazzo pants. I'm learning how to draft clothing of my own, and this is one of my experiments. I've learned a lot already, but I thought I'd take you along and show you some of the sewing techniques that goes into the finishing. We are going to start by looking at the pocket. Come on in, Addie. So you see I've got this really nice row of double stitching. Are you so impressed at how I can do one edge and then the other exactly the same distance apart? Well, you shouldn't be because it turns out it's all in the needle. So we're going to begin by looking at the double needle. The double needle has a single shank. And you can see I've been drawing. Um, so the double needle has a single shank that goes up into the machine and then it has two points of access for the thread. And because those two needles are exactly the same apart, it's the same width apart from each other, no matter which stitch you're making, that is what holds the consistency around the edge of the pocket. So we're going to start by putting the double needle in and then I'll show you how to thread your machine with that. We begin by removing this foot. The double needle itself takes a little extra space so it's just nicer to have the foot out of the way. So I've removed the single needle and then I'm going to go ahead and put the double needle right on in. Oops, sorry, hold it steady and turn the little crank until it is well secured. Then I can put my foot right back on again. I'm going to put this needle aside so that I don't lose it. In the meantime, I want you guys to check out the machine up here. You'll notice that I've got my thread here and I've got this spool upright. We are going to thread both of those points at the same time. So I'm pulling my thread out the direction that it travels normally so that I don't build up any excessive um, lint on the inside. And now I'm going to pick up both threads from both locations. And I find it easiest to have them about the same length as each other. I'm pulling them together. I'm going to treat them as if they are the same thread, just drawing it back and forth through my machine all the way down here. Come on, little friend. Ah, oh, wrong side. Okay, until I have both needles in front. I cannot use the needle threader with a double needle. It's set up to line up right here in the center, but I've got my two needles. And for the sake of you being able to see, I'm going to go ahead and remove that foot again. And I'm going to draw the one thread right through the needle. And then I'm going to draw the next thread right through the needle. So both threads have their own needle and they're going to move oh they're going to move in unison with each other. So I'm going to slide the foot back on and I'm going to go ahead and draw the bottom thread up. And back up. Now in doing that I just reminded myself something very important with these smarter Bernina machines. Come on around this way Abby so you can see up at the front. I need to let my Bernina know that I'm working on a double needle. So I'm just gonna select that. Here's my needle um, option. I'm gonna select the double needle and tell it OK. That way it'll help remind me in case I try to do something stupid like a giant zigzag stitch where there's not room for both of those needles to move the full width of the zigzag. So with that all set up, 
I wanted to take a second and show you some of what will happen. Okay, so. so can you see this well, Abby? I don't know how well it shows up, but this particular um, set of double stitches, there's a pretty significant raised edge on that. Do you see it? And then I adjust the tension till I'm getting down here to where there's almost no raised edge at all. The raised edge happens because we only have one thread and the bobbin and it does a zigzag between those two pieces, between the two threads that are coming down, pulling it into the center. So if I was creating a decorative stitch down the front of a blouse, I would really like this raised stitch. I can even do it so that I can pick up the bobbin thread, which I'm going to try to do right here. And as I pull the bobbin thread, do you see how it's pulling that in really nice and tight? That is a shortcut for pin tucks, my friend. Pretty cool. Um, but it is definitely not the look I want on my backside. On my backside, I'd prefer for it to be pretty smooth, which means I'm going to lower the upper tension, which happens right here. And I'm going to drag it all the way down to two. I believe. Yes, all the way down to two. And that's going to give me this really nice smooth stitch. So here I have my pocket all pinned on and ready to go. And let me put it in the machine. So I'm going to slide it under. And when I'm working with fabric that's kind of drapey and heavy, I'm going to push my machine back a little bit and I'm going to wad part of it up underneath the machine so that it's not pulling against me. Lining up on the edge right here, um, I'm going to sight this. If you're uncomfortable with the sighting, you might want to use the edge stitch foot, which I'm going to show you later, but for now I wanted to just give you this example. One second, fighting with the foot pedal down under here. Okay, so one of the things about a double needle is the cornering is different. Think of it in terms of driving a semi as compared to a little sports car. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin and then do my little tiny back stitch. I don't like to see very much back stitching when I'm doing finished stitches, so I will never go back more than two stitches when I'm doing finished work. Make sure that you're pulling pins out as you go along. Stitching over pins puts everybody in danger, your machine, your pins, and your eyeballs in the case of broken pins flying. I'm going to use my little purple thing to help make sure that my layers are all tucking under there. See how it's trying to build that little ridge? I'm just going to remind it that it's going under. I think my stitch length is a little short. Okay, that's going to be better. So my stitch length was too short. And I will show you when we pull it off the difference in that look. Okay, and you see how I'm pulling the fabric up so that it's not resisting my motion. Don't be afraid to put the needles down and move your pins as needed. Okay, we're coming on around to this sharp little corner, you see it okay? To this little corner down here. And just to help myself keep track of it, I'm just gonna put my purple thing slash stiletto right there. And I'm gonna get all the way there. Normally, I would put the needle down, lift the foot and pivot, but remember how we were talking about that driving like a semi instead of driving like a little sports car? In this case, I'm going to make sure that the bulk of the fabric is over that way. I'm going to raise the needle 
and I'm going to raise the foot. But to make sure I don't get too crazy, I'm going to lift and keep this finger kind of secured as I make my pivot. I don't want to push, <laughs> I guess I'm going to lift the back of the fabric. I don't want to push things too far out of alignment because those threads are going to follow whatever I'm doing with this stitch. the top and again I don't like to go back stitching very much at all so that's as much as I'm gonna do and then out we come okay so let's see if I can show you we're gonna look down right here and I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see it maybe a little bit right here there's kind of a crisscross that happens where that inner needle kind of lost ground and had to come back up again that's about as much as you want it to do. But looking at the pocket in general, you can see that things lay pretty well. But do you see this curling up that the pocket is doing? The reason that is doing that is because these stitches are too small and it's created kind of a rigid line on my more loosely woven fabric. So honestly, what's gonna happen is I'm going to unstitch this much of the pocket and restitch that. But I won't make you watch me do that. What I'd like to do now is move on to the waistband. In order to do the waistband, I want to go back to a single needle. So I'm going to remove my foot, pull the needle out, and I always put my needle back in the case because then I know that what we're talking about is still the denim needle um, and I have the information that I need. All right. <laughs> okay. Rather than putting back on our regular foot, I want to share with you the edge stitch foot and let's see. This is let's try looking at it this way with a dark background. This is the blind hem foot. You see this little divider point right in here? And it has a little crooked, a little well in it right there so that the needle can slide along. Let's see. There. Okay, now I think you can see that crooked little well. The needle slides right in against there and it lets me get a really, really close edge on what I'm stitching and that that little bar over the top holds the tension of the zigzag stitch so this one's the blind hand stitch we're gonna finish the video with I mean our our tips and tricks with that one so I'm gonna set it aside this one you see how it's open back there this one is the edge stitch we use it a lot in quilting when we are working on binding or um, other kinds of edges with ridges. And in this case, I'm going to show you how we would use it when the ridge that we're working on is in a garment. Now, I no longer need the double thread. And you could actually stitch with the double thread if you were working on something that you really wanted to have that extra presence of thread. In this case, I just want it to hold it closed, so I'm going to skip that extra thread. All right. Come on, thread. There we go. Up into the back. Okay, so remember how we changed the tension. We need to adjust that by going back to the natural tension. We need to tell the sewing machine we're just using the one needle again. Thank you very much. And we're going to keep my elongated stitch at three. Um, three is about the, is usually where garments sit. 
um, we don't want to create that same sort of, well, that little puckering that I showed you. So working with this edge stitch foot is a little bit like bowling with the gutter guard on. It just helps you be more successful. If I were, Abby, can you get all the way in there where you can see the ridge? Okay, if I were to stitch right there, can you see how the needle is lined up actually with the foot itself? That doesn't serve my purposes here very well at all. So what I'm gonna do is move the needle over so that it's actually riding on the ridge of the fabric, just on the inside. Are you with me, machine? Yep, okay, so that's gonna give me a really close, yep, that's, oh, we can go over one more. We're gonna go over to five. So that's gonna give me a nice stitch line clearly on the top of this fold moving right along here, okay? So I'm gonna back this up to our actual start position. There is a lot of bulk that's happening right there because of all of the interactions of the seams and whatnot, so I am not going to back stitch. Instead, I will pull the threads to the back and tie a little knot later. I, I could use the, the knot on the um, machine, but I find that right here in this spot where we're so vulnerable to getting caught, I just don't like to do any of that. So you can see where the roll of the fabric is right up against the, the gutter guard of our foot and it's keeping me really, really straight. In fact, I'm just going to push the pedal. No hands. And you see that right here where we've got this intersection with my pocket, this is on a spring. And so it lifts up and I can just make sure that it rides right over the ridge of that pocket and keep on going. Okay, so that is the demonstration of that guy. And of course, if I was doing it for real, I'd keep going. But you see, I've got my really, really straight edge right there along the top stitch edge. Okay, now I want to talk to you about hems for a moment. Last week, we discussed just a little bit, we discussed grading. Only, give me a second, we should turn these guys inside out so that I can have a little chat with you about the shape of this hem. <clears throat> All right, Abby, back up just a little bit so you can see the full length of the pants. Do you see how wide those legs are? Those are um, almost skirt width legs, which is exactly what I wanted when I drafted it. But it does present a little bit of a challenge in terms of how to finish the pant. So I chose to actually create a hem facing. So I've got this piece of fabric here out on the edge and I've got my seam and then this is the main body of the pant. Just like we did last week, I want to grade the seams so that I have a smooth transition. Right here I've got all of the bulk of everything and in this fabric you can see better this, this hard edge and the lump that I've got going on here. So again, we grade with the shortest edge closest to our finished garment face. So when you're looking at it from the outside, that's where the lowest step should be. So the way I think of it is as I'm approaching the front door, the low step is when I first see the door and I have higher steps as I go deeper in, closer to, the, to entering the house. It's the little game I tell myself. So we've graded the hem. And I've chosen in this case to go ahead and leave this surged edge. But now when I flip it around from the front, don't know if you can really see it on the camera, but I can see that there is a transition of 
this part is a little darker and this part is not quite as dark and then by the time I get the whole facing on it almost disappears so that's that's why I'm choosing to manage that hem that way we can still use our edge stitch and remember we did under stitching right now if I try to fold this forward it's going to try to do this little thing where this curved edge pokes out towards the finished edge of the garment. What I want it to do is to stay on that back side so I have this perfectly clean edge. Edge stitching helps me get to that. And just as a quick review for edge stitching, that's when we push the seam allowance towards the facing piece. And then just like I did with the waistband, I'm going to edge stitch that in place and just zing my way all the way around. You can see that I'm pulling the, the seam apart just a little bit. I'm not doing a lot of tugging, just mostly reminding the fabric that that's where it wants to bend. If I tug very much, I will push it out of alignment and I can create a pretty rippled edge when I want a very smooth, clean cut. So if you guys will just hang with me while we go around the corner, I'll show you what that looks like on the other side. Do we have any questions? Yes, we have the numbers of the two feet that you're using. Um, 10 and five. So 10 is the edge stitch foot. And five is the line hem which we're coming to in just a moment. It's a long way around these pants. Didn't seem like that long when I was drafting them, but it feels that long when I'm showing them to you. Okay, so now we've got that little edge and you can see even as I just hold the fabric, I'm just gonna pick it up and you will see even in that middle part, it's trying to fold, making sure that that little ridge rolls to the back. That's why you would take time to edge stitch. So, new leg, same edge stitching and what we're looking at here is the inside of the garment again. I have the facing pressed up and now we're going to do a blind hem. So the advantage of the blind hem is as a silhouette, once I've got this to be the face of my garment, if I were to do the regular stitching all the way across, I actually create a dividing line. So if my aesthetic goal is to have that whole long length of pants be a smooth, steady line, if I stitch on top so that the stitches are available, my eye is distracted by that extra line. And if I put in a blind hem, then I can have that long, smooth look, which is why we tend to put blind hems in highly polished garments and in things like men's suit coat slacks. I mean suit slacks. So we're going to remove this foot and we're going to go to our blind hem foot. Remember that our blind hem foot, which is number five, has that little little round part in it and we're gonna tuck it in. We need a new stitch. So the way a blind stitch works is we're doing a zigzag that's gonna catch the face of the garment just a little bit. And that one is number nine. And earlier I was like, is this one it or is this one it? So 9 or 29. If I hit my question mark and say yes, tell me about that stitch, this is the blind stitch, the narrow one. Whereas if I'm looking up here at number 9 and I say tell me about this stitch, <laughs> it's the blind stitch. Guess what guys, I was right in both places. So this is the one we're going to use and we're going to increase, you see as I turn the knob, my, my um, zigzag is getting larger. I messed with it a little bit earlier and found that I need a 
stitch. You know what, let me show you what it looks like when it's too small. We're gonna start with a three, and then I'll show you how that doesn't work, and then I'll show you how it does work with the four. Okay, so switch sides with me, Abby. Here's the thing. Here is my hemmed edge. Here is my surged edge. If I didn't have a serger, then I could have folded this much down and done a little top stitch, but I want this edge to be somewhat finished because it's gonna remain exposed in the garment. With the hem now pivoting toward the main body of the garment, I'm gonna set myself up in this situation. Under the foot, I'm going to have about a quarter of an inch. Oh, we should go back a second. Please notice that I have my pins going in. They're not on the edge and they're kind of away. I want it to be holding that the fabric is gonna go this way in the, as a finished piece, but I also need to be able to do this flip, which is why those pins are anchored weirdly. It also means because they're kind of removed from the edge, I don't have to fish them out as I sew along. I can let them just stay there without endangering um, needles, machine, or self. Okay, so flipping things back over. I now have a little piece of my hem sticking out. I've got my pins that are helping the fabric remember that this is how we want to fold things. And I'm gonna line my, this edge here on the edge of my foot, see how it's in a little too far, so I'm gonna lift up and I'm gonna pull that out and relax the fold, but now the fold is up against my guard edge. Is that clear? Can you see that? Okay, so watching the shape of the stitch, you're going to see that the stitch is going to run a couple of stitches here and then it's gonna jump over and try to bite a little bit of the fabric there. Can you see the stitch shape? Or is the foot in the way? Okay, you wanna switch the other side? Okay, so see how the, we're mostly, we're going Outside, 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 bite to the end. Outside, 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 bite to the end, okay? So, I'm gonna show you. Look, nothing happened. The fact that my finger goes all the way under there tells me that this stitch was too small. So, we're gonna go back and we're going to go ahead um, and increase our stitch width to four and our stitch length, I bumped it. We're gonna go ahead and go back to five. So this is doing a little bit of puckering, which I know later is gonna be an issue. So I'm going to unpick that when I get home and we're gonna just go ahead and slide on to a fresh spot up here so that you guys can see what that looks like. Okay, again, my finished hem edge is going to fold underneath. I'm going to give myself my extra little piece hanging out. I'm gonna slide it in under so that my finished edge is touching against my foot and so that the fold is nicely against that guard. Okay. Rolling forward, I'm checking my distance. I can eyeball how smooth things need to be. This also lifts up, so right there where I had that extra bulk of the seam, if I needed to, I could have lifted it up over that. Okay. So now, I can no longer run my finger under there. And if you look, you can see where the stress of the stitches is showing. Now, when I turn it all the way around, on the front of the garment, all you can see are those little pricks. 
That's where that zigzag stitch reached up and grabbed it. Right now it's a pretty obvious situation, but once I press that out, that'll smooth down and it will be nearly invisible. So that's our blind cam. Right here, you see that tuck? That's where the machine did the automatic little knot situation. And so that is multiple stitches together, which again, I will take out when I'm done with the video. Um, and I will set the machine so that it doesn't do that because I don't want any extra bulk on there. I want it to look really invisible like I've got it here. Um, and then let me just do a quick check to make sure that's what I had for you. Yep, that's what we got today, guys. So if you have any further questions about garment construction or garment finishing, I will make my best attempt to address those and just send those to Marsha or comment about what else you would like to see or what you're curious about. Thank you so much for tuning in. Oh, I was also supposed to ask, Mar Marsha can do an unboxing today. So if you guys want that, quick get that in your little comments. Um, otherwise, she will do the unboxing um, tomorrow. How are we looking? Do we want more boxing? Nothing yet. 20 All right, seconds. 20 seconds. Okay, so while we're doing 20 seconds, <laughs> look, at look, look at this random thing that I'm wearing. Um, I call it the random thing because this is made out of, my husband's t-shirt is the black, and then my shirt that I changed size and I couldn't wear it anymore, so I cut the sleeves off and attached it to my bodice and did some um, reverse applique mm -hmm. to mess around with some work. So that's what silly thing I'm wearing today. How are we looking about unboxing? Marsha here says yes. And I think that's all I said. Okay, we'll do it tomorrow. All right, Martha, tune in tomorrow <laughs> at 2.15. At 2.15. 12, 12, 12 no, sorry. we totally lied. You better come for lunch at 12.15. Yes. Okay. And Marsha will unbox at 12.15. Thank you all for signing in and staying with us. We'll see you next time. Bye.